So we have the very first CKD summit, and it's building a roadmap to reduce preventable kidney disease. And as soon as he gets these going. So I tell a lot of stories, but I'm going to, because we don't have a lot of time today, I'm not going to try to tell too many stories. But I do want to start by with one that many of you may have heard. As you see, as a Surgeon General, I was a three-star admiral. And as an admiral, most people think you're a general, but really was an admiral. Um, the Public Health Service uh, led the United States Public Health Service, and um, we were started under John Adams and in response to a public health need of, um, when the country was being um, under attack by yellow people. And so that was how great we came. But I want to tell a story about a young guy who was a young ensign on a battleship. And he, can you hear me pretty well? Yeah. Okay, so this young ensign had a battleship and he had a duty and he had to watch. And if everything was going quiet and it was okay during the night until he saw the light in the distance and he plotted out the course. And he realized it was in direct path of this great battleship. So he flashed out a warning, you in direct path of a great battleship, all to your course. The reply came back, no, you all to your course. So starting getting late, he had to wake up his captain. The captain came, assessed the situation, came to the same conclusion, and the captain flashed out a warning, you're in direct path of a great battleship all to your reports immediately. They waited, reply came back, no, you all to your reports. So by this time it was really getting late, so they had to wake up the admiral. And at that time the admiral was walking in. So he came, and it's like any good CEO, if you want something done well, you do it yourself. So he, he plotted out the course, came to the same conclusion, flashed out a warning, your direct path of a great battleship alter your course immediately. I am an admiral. So he waited for a reply, and no reply. Waited, still no reply. Finally the reply came back, no you alter your course, I am a lighthouse. <laughs> <laughs> so I believe we have to be lighthouses to change directions of these great battleships that are going in the wrong direction. We know they're going in the wrong direction. And battleships like um, health disparities and obesity, diabetes and hypertension, and as we will be talking about all day today, preventable chronic kidney disease. You know, more than 26 million Americans are affected by chronic kidney disease, yet let up to almost 90% of the people who have it don't even know that they have it. That's really our challenge. And it's estimated that one in three Americans are at risk for chronic kidney disease within their lifetime. And that's a st staggering um, statistic, especially because there's so much more we could be doing to prevent the disease from ever, ever developing in the first place. And the risk factors, as almost everybody in this room knows, for kidney disease include the diabetes, the high blood pressure, the family history, and advanced age of over 60. Because some of us are getting there, that's not too advanced anymore, but over 60. Um, also, people of African American, Hispanic, and Native American, as well as Asian or Pacific Islanders, are at increased risk for developing uh, kidney disease. And African Americans are three and a half times more likely than Hispanic, and Hispanics are one and a half times more likely to experience kidney failure. So we've got an enormous opportunity for prevention. And the medical researchers have already shown and demonstrated that early intervention can slow the progression of chronic kidney disease. So now what we really have the key is to diagnose the disease much earlier in order to improve the quality of life, as, as well as potentially expand a patient's lifespan. <coughs> so as a leader in public health um, and prevention, I really find that population health is very important, and particularly in, com in communities. So I thought I'd spend just a minute to tell you how I kind of got involved with um, my community. Um, when I was an intern, I attended the Medical Association of Georgia's annual meeting that year, and there was a room of people with maybe this side of number of people, maybe 20 people in the, 
in the room and um, the topic at that, that time could it easily have been kidney disease, but it was it's sexually transmitted diseases needed to be taught in medical school. Well, I stood up in that room and I said I'd never seen certain diseases except in the textbook, and so I thought there was a need. The resolution passed and the Georgia delegation forwarded that resolution to the American Medical Association. And they took me to the AMA to speak to the same issue. And when I spoke to it at the um, AMA, within six months, every medical school in this country was encouraged to include sexually transmitted diseases as part of their core curriculum. I learned that one person can make a difference, whether it's in medical policy or in medical practice. And I learned I could make a difference in medical practice when the National Health Service Corps sent me to buy a factory, Alabama. It's a pretty place, but it's a poor place. I found a community of working poor, too poor to afford medical care, but too rich to qualify for Medicaid. And I liked the people, and I liked the practice, and I wanted, really wanted to practice medicine there. I really quickly learned practice of medicine wasn't just someone up to shark bites. I had to deal with the land sharks, the regulators, the reviewers. CMS, CMS didn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> used to be it. All those things, and, and they were a real part of practice in medicine. And I hope that today we will talk about the real things that, that um, doctors out in the community, in the hospitals, every day have to deal with, and we can help them, particularly with this particular um, disease, to understand it and to help. Hopefully, uh, hopefully we will um, re reduce the number of available cases of, of chronic renal disease. You know, I also found that my patients had other problems like adequate housing, especially after Katrina and other things. But it was kind of mixed feelings that I agreed after 23 years of solo practice in, in a small town to accept the president's, um, I wouldn't say request, but offer, um, when you can't refuse, the, to become Surgeon General. And, and I, I, I actually, it was an experience, and I discussed it with the patients, but then I realized when I got there, I had 300 million Americans as one of the patients. And so we had opportunities to, to make impacts on a larger, um, a larger scale, but still, patients are patients, whether it's 300 million or it's one in biometric. And I think that's what we're kind of talking about. I mean, everybody wants to be treated the same with compassion and care. But health doesn't occur in the doctor's office and hospitals only. And everybody's heard me talk always, and health also occurs where we live, where we learn, where we work, where we play, and where we pray. Health is in everything that we do. And that's where the prevention comes in. Prevention is not new to the national dialogue. However, um, in recent years, American families had to deal with chronic diseases like diabetes and hypertension and stroke and chronic kidney disease and a tragic toll that it takes, both personally and financially, on the patients, on our patients, on their families, the communities, and their workplace. We have to make prevention part of our everyday lives and empower people to make better health choices. And so I was really pleased to be a part of the Obama administration when we launched this broad agenda to help Americans get healthy, live longer, stay well, and thrive. And as Surgeon General had the privilege of chairing the National Prevention um, Health Promotion Public Health Council. And that was a council that, was, or is a council, that consists of 17 cabinet level um, members and heads of agencies like the Department of Health, the Secretary of Transportation, Agriculture, Labor, EPA, uh, HUD, and Defense. All of these, for the first time, cabinet level members coming around for the first time to talk about prevention and to talk about health. And the council released the first ever national prevention strategy. Let's see what these slides are. So the council was established in 2010 and we released the first ever national prevention strategy. And um, like I said earlier, if we want to reform healthcare in this country, we have to prevent people from getting sick in the first place. It's like we have to do chronic kidney disease. So in addition to the art of medicine, we need a new approach to promoting prevention in the communities. Sustained health depends on other factors of influence on health, like housing, and transportation, education, the availability of quality affordable foods, our environments, and our workplaces. 
we have to change the way we think about health in this country. And so today we're going to talk about how we change the way we think about chronic kidney disease in this country. And that's going to call for us to take a more holistic and integrated approach um, to chronic kidney disease. The National Prevention Strategy, I'm going to go through it a little bit, it had um, several parts. Basically, the goal is to increase the number of Americans who are healthy at every stage of life. There were four pillars, healthy and safe community environments, clinical and community preventive services, empowered people, and health disparities. When we talk about um, kidney disease, it's all four of those. Um, particularly the clinical and community preventive services will be talking about a lot because that's what we can influence. But all of these come into play, and there were other things that were around there, tobacco living, drug abuse, violence, injury, active living, those are the things that really make a healthy community. And we want to do our part today to talk about how we can um, decrease that burden of kidney disease. And then other things about exercise and things. Go back to that. So that's why we're here. And we want patients to really own this illness and, and understand it and, and and advocate for it in everything they do. We did this with diabetes, and we have some diabetes experts here today. Um, when we, we people know what their A1C is now. We want them to know what numbers they need to know. Um, we want them to ask to say, um, "Have you checked your kidney status?" One of the initiatives we had was about HIV, particularly in African American communities. Um, know your HIV status just like you know your blood pressure know your kidney status just like you know your blood pressure. Um, be aware. But in the end of the day, becoming a more healthy and fit nation, um, particularly relative to um, kidney disease, is going to require more than just educating the public or creating these programs of piecemeal. It's going to require a unified plan of action, like we're going to try to develop today, the CDK um, Intercept Roadmap. So we want to um, create this roadmap. And once we create it, it also requires a dedicated group of leaders just like you. And so at the end of today, and I'll come back up here and tell you the same thing, this will be a beginning. We want to start with the, the inaugural group that really will set the pace for the nation to become a more and healthy nation, in particular regards to one of the most preventable illnesses that we have, which is kidney disease. So with that, I'm going to bring up our moderator and let her get us started. Ellen, we're person met already. And some of you we met last night at the dinner. The others will be very soon. That's right. Thanks. Thank you so much.